Somehow I got through the whole campaign season without reading Barack Obama's Audacity of Hope. But then in recent weeks, two friends of mine who are not supporters of Obama at all, they're political opponents of his, but both said to me on separate occasions, it's really a good book, you ought to read it. So recently I was coming back from um, a trip and I'm there at the airport and I see the book staring at me at the bookstore. So I said, okay, I can take a hint. So I bought the book and I read most of it on the plane on the way home. And I can see what my friends admired in it. It's a very gracefully written book. Obama is that rare politician, I mean Lincoln comes to mind, who can also write. You can hear his own voice in it too. It's clearly not ghost written. It's his own voice. And he's a lot of very wise things to say about politics. I'm a bit of a political uh, junkie. I love the study of politics. And he's got a lot of um, wise remarks to make about the Democrat-Republican battle, about the influence of the 60s still on our politics, about the danger of money in our political system, about Clinton and Reagan. I mean, a lot of really interesting things. The chapter I turn to with greatest interest, I must say, is the one on the Constitution. Because I knew that Barack Obama had been a professor of constitutional law at the University of Chicago. So I read the chapter with great interest, and it's the most really philosophical in the book. He says this, the American genius politically, and it's expressed in people like John Jay and Madison and the other framers of the Constitution, the American genius was to set up the system of checks and balances, and not just at the government level, but really across the society, a system of checks and balances so that no one party or no one faction can dominate. But there's this pitting of interests against one another. Through this process of, of debate and argumentation, we come to a sort of a rough consensus. And I think very legitimately he praises that as part of the uh, American genius politically. But then he takes a step that bugged me. And I put no in the margin of the book. I knew I balked that point because he pressed this even to the level of the moral ends of the society. He said part of the American political um, genius is to say there are no absolute truths, that even the ends themselves become a matter of pragmatic compromise and debate. And again, that's where I said no. That's where I said I've got to get off this train. Because my conviction is the one that we learned from John Paul II and Benedict XVI. Great admirers of democracy, by the way. I mean, one of the greatest a uh, defender of democracy on the world stage was John Paul II for many years. But they both say this, a democracy will function properly if and only if there is no ambiguity about the essential moral structure of the society. There are certain basic ends, certain absolute truths that have to be acknowledged. Now, we can deliberate about means all we want, how best to achieve these great moral ends of the society, but if the moral ends themselves become a matter of debate, now we lead the country on a short road to chaos. Now the structuring of moral logic of the society devolves. Okay, so I put no and exclamation points, I'm underlining things in the text. I then read on, and here's the peculiar thing. I think Barack Obama, at least in part of his mind, agrees with me, because a page later he says, you know, to be honest, when I look at the 19th century, I see there were figures like Harriet Tubman, John Brown, William Lloyd Garrison. There were the great abolitionists, the great opponents of slavery. And he realizes they did not debate about the moral question of slavery. They were utterly convinced that slavery was a moral outrage that had to be ended. They weren't open to argument about it. They weren't open to debate or deliberation. They were moral absolutists about slavery. Now, they worked within the democratic system, that's true, but there was no ambiguity about the issue of slavery. And Obama acknowledges, hmm, that goes against the principle that I've just articulated. And he says, the fact that I, a, an African-American, am now running for president, is because of people like that in the 19th century who saw these, um, moral absolutes. And so he acknowledges, and I, I praise him for this, he says, no, I guess sometimes absolute truths really are absolute. And I wrote in the margin, right, but you can't have it both ways. You can't hold to that and hold that we can deliberate and debate even about ultimate ends. Okay, now what prevents this from being simply an abstract discussion of political philosophy? I think it's the issue that oddly haunts the book, abortion. 
Barack Obama addresses abortion explicitly in one part of the book and uses a lot of the standard pro-choice kind of argumentation. But here's what I found fascinating. Obliquely, tangentially, uh, indirectly, it comes up all the time. Throughout the book, he mentions abortion here and there, returns to it, worries over it, fusses about it. I began to underline every time abortion came up, and it's all through the book. And here's why I think, and I'm doing a little bit of armchair psychologizing here. I think it bugs him because he knows that that issue lies on the very fault line I've been describing. I think he sees there is a logic that connects the opposition to slavery in the 19th century the opposition to segregation in the mid-20th century, and the opposition to abortion now. That those who say, look, the, taking, the direct taking of the life of the innocent is morally repugnant. It's something that we don't debate about. We recognize it as one of the structuring elements of a decent society. We shouldn't debate about it. We should now find the best means to make sure that that's part of our, our uh, political life. I think at some level he knows that. And I think it, it bugs him. That's what I sensed as I read the book. What strikes me is we need to have moral clarity about ends and means. You can deliberate about means, but you shouldn't deliberate about ends. When we lose that clarity, problems arise. When we have that clarity, then I think we can have the audacity to hope for a really just society.